Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club and the Westpac Address, coming to you today from Ngunnawal and Nambri country, Canberra. My name is Laura Tingle. I'm the club's president. The Northern Territory feels like another world away to the national capital, particularly at this time of year. But the issues it confronts puts it at the sharp edge of so many current national debates. As the jurisdiction with the highest proportion of Indigenous Australians and some of the most disadvantaged dis Indigenous communities, the issues raised by the proposal for an Indigenous voice to the Parliament have a particular resonance. The Northern Territory also finds itself at the centre of the country's strategic and geographic importance at a time of regional insecurity. But some of the day-to-day -day most contentious political issues in the Territory relate to the conflicts around mining and resources, gas and fracking, and our future in energy needs, and how they balance with the environment. To discuss all these issues and more, please welcome the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, Natasha Files, to address us. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Morris, for having me here today. And it's great to see a few friendly faces from the Territory here as well. I acknowledge the First Nations people on whose land we meet, part of the oldest continuous culture in the world. I've come to you today from the Larrakia country in the Territory's top end. If you fly out east of Darwin a bit over an hour, you'll find northeast Arnhem Land, home of the Yongu people, the Ritijingu and the Gumach clans, and the Gama Festival, which is back on this weekend. It's where Dr Unipingu lived, worked, and led. Land rights, the Urukala Bark Petitions, the Barunga Statement, the Uluru Statement from the Heart, the Voice. And even though he is gone, his work, his wisdom still echo. Shortly after he died in April, the full bench of the federal court ruled favourably on action he brought. The court agreed with him that the Commonwealth failed to compensate the Gumach and other clans when it approved bauxite being extracted from their land back in 1968. That decision is now being appealed to the High Court. More than half a century later, justice is a long time coming and it still hasn't arrived. In the Northern Territory, we see the anguish that painful battles bring justice, that the battles for justice bring upon generations whether it's the stolen generations fighting to be heard or the traditional owners fighting to be acknowledged. And we see the long-lasting impact of ill-considered ideas, interferences and interventions. We see it reflected in poor health, school dropouts and unemployment. We see it in homelessness and poverty, dysfunction and disadvantage. We see the hope in the eyes of little children with a life full of opportunity ahead of them. We see that hope slowly extinguished as they are let down by policies, procedures, and most of all, by people. We're all familiar with the powerful moments that inch our country closer to justice and reconciliation for its First Nations. The 67 referendum, Mabo and Wick, the apology. Incredibly powerful moments and empowering. And this year, our generation is tasked with taking the next step by making things right in our constitution and by making things better with a voice. Not because it's a bit of nice, feel-good symbolism, but because it's more than that. Because it's what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have told us they want after years of careful and considered discussion because it can make a practical difference for people in communities across the Territory and across the country, and most of all, for our children. Because if we truly want to start making things better, we can do a lot worse than to start by listening. Maybe this makes so much sense for many Territorians because we, more than most, deal with the consequences of failed policies, sometimes with good intentions, often without them. Designed and delivered by people living on the other side of the country. Or maybe it makes sense to us because we, more than most, know what it's like to speak to powerful people in Canberra but not be heard. 
And that's why I'm here this week. And I've bought reinforcements and I acknowledge the Territory Industry leaders and my colleagues, Nicole Manison, Eva Lawler, Paul Kirby, Kate Warden and Nari Akit. So the Territory can be seen and be heard. We call it Facing North. A few days on the Capitol Hill calendar for us to bang our drum with government, investors, employers, community and cultural leaders to talk about the future we're building for the Territory. Now, I think it says something for the rest of the nation to face north, we fly south to do it. But if that's what it takes, so be it. Because we do it, because we know that for many East Coasters, the Territory is still something of a stereotype. When you think of us, you might think of Kakadu and Uluru, camping and crocodiles. You might think of our rugged landscapes and our laid back lifestyle. Or you might think of the big generational challenges we face, like our fight against chronic disease, alcohol abuse or domestic violence. All of this is real, the good and the bad. But that's not all we are, not even close. Often that the picture of people down south have of us is incomplete, ill-informed or just plain ignorant. And that's not your fault, it's just the way it is. And it's up to people like me to try and change that. So today, I want to talk to you about the Territory story, the full story, about our incredible opportunities as well as our challenges, about the Territory taking its rightful place in the country and the region. I want to tell you what we're doing up north and why you need to know about it. Because now, more than ever, the Territory is too important to ignore. Ever since the Betty Bombers and the Zeros rained hell on Darwin in 1942, the strategic significance of Northern Australia has been acknowledged, but not always understood. That appears to be changing now. The Defence Strategic Review has triggered one of the greatest shifts ever in the Australian Defence Force's structure, posture and investment priorities. The review states that the ADF must have the capacity to defend Australia and our immediate region, protect Australia's economic connection to our region and to the world, contribute to the collective security of the Indo-Pacific and to maintain the global rules-based order of the world. The ADF's strategic imperatives have one thing in common. All of them relate directly to Northern Australia and more directly to Darwin. You can't have any of these outcomes without involving the Northern Territory. In practical terms, it means more personnel and more platforms heading north. In 1942, our location at the centre of the Indo-Pacific made us highly valuable to our aggressors. Today, it makes us highly valuable to our allies. But our growing value isn't just geopolitical, it's economic too. We are neighbours to an enormous and expanding middle class. While Territorians have to fly four or five hours south to reach Australia's big cities with a few million people in them, there are half a billion people within five hours to our north. The markets and potential for trade out of northern Australia are huge. Whether it's energy, rare earths, critical minerals, subsea fibre links or agriculture, the economy we're building is unlocking this potential and unleashing new sources of sustainable growth. Take critical minerals. Last year, Jim Chalmers called critical minerals the opportunity of the century. And I think he's right. He said, we have exactly what the world needs, exactly when the world needs it. I would just like to add one more thing to that. The territory has it exactly where we need it, on the doorstep to Asia. We hold 15 of the world's critical minerals not just lithium and manganese, but cobalt, nickel, copper, phosphate, zinc and more. Our extraordinary potential has been backed by the Fraser Institute's global survey of mining companies. We now rank six in the world for investment attractiveness. And over the last five years, we've had the strongest improvement on this index of any Australian jurisdiction. We've leapfrogged Queensland and South Australia. When it comes to best practice mineral potential, we are number one in the world 
jumping from 11th last year. And again, over the last five years, we've had the strongest improvement of any Australian jurisdiction on this index. And when you see what's already happening in the Territory, just at the beginning of this minerals revolution, it's easy to understand why we're top of the table. Core Lithium started production at its mine just outside of Darwin last year and started exporting this year. It's the Territory's first lithium mine and we don't intend for it to be the last. In fact, we've already approved the second. North of Alice Springs is the Arafura Rare Earths Nolans project. It's looking to be Australia's first integrated mine and rare earths separation plant. It's already signed agreements with electric car manufacturers and wind turbine producers. Overall, our major projects in critical minerals have the potential to deliver more than $7 billion in capital investment, more than 5,000 construction jobs, more than 3,000 long-term operational jobs. Critical minerals are the key to the net, and net zero transition at home and abroad. And the Territory holds that key. But we aren't just looking at these new modern mining prospects as opportunities to export, extract and export. We want to grab all the economic value we can from them. So we're not just digging and shipping, but we're digging, processing, refining, manufacturing and then shipping creating long-term jobs for Territorians up and along the value chain. That's a part of our long-term vision for the Territory's economy. And at the heart of the vision is the Middle Arm Sustainable Development Precinct. Middle Arm isn't just about creating jobs. It's about the kind of economy and the kind of jobs we're creating. We know our economic future needs to be built on diversifying our economy so growth and jobs are coming from more industries. We know our economic future needs to be powered by renewable and lower emissions energy. And that's what Middle Arm is all about. It's being developed to attract industries that reflect the economy we want to build. Solar, hydrogen, minerals processing, advanced manufacturing, carbon capture and storage. Middle Arm is a part of our master plan for growth in the Territory but it's also a masterclass for large-scale industrial hubs. To support the project, the Northern Territory Government has commissioned more than 200 studies and technical assessments to pre-prepare the site. We're making it ready for investors, sorting out the power and water supplies, access roads and shared infrastructure, advancing precinct-wide environmental assessments and approvals, so that investors have the confidence they need to create new industries and new jobs, and to do it safely and sustainably. And it's working. We've got agreements with five proponents representing billions of dollars of investment and thousands of jobs to progress the work at Middle Arm over the next 12 months. In hydrogen production, minerals processing and manufacturing, and low CO2 natural gas export. We are absolutely committed to transitioning to net zero emissions. And Middle Arm will play a huge part in that transition. And so will the Sun Cable Project, slated to be the world's biggest solar farm, right in the heart of the Territory. A new renewable source of power for industrial development locally and for export internationally. And most importantly for us, a new source of Territory jobs. This is what responsible decarbonising and diversifying our economy looks like. And we're grateful to the federal government for backing both the Sun Cable Project and the Middle Arm Sustainable Development Precinct. Just a few weeks ago, the Prime Minister was in Berlin saying he wants Australia to be a renewable energy export superpower and he wants to see us exporting green hydrogen derivatives to Germany. I couldn't agree more and I'm happy to give the PM or even the German Chancellor, a tour of Middle Arm, to show them how the Territory plans to play a leading role in turbocharging renewable and superpower status. The opportunities for energy transition, exports and jobs are why we love Middle Arm. That's why we're building it. And the teals and trolls can spread their nonsense about it all they want. 
But they should know it's going to take a lot more than a couple of tweets for us to back down. The Territory is not for turning. You know, it's bad enough to be lectured by people living on Sydney's northern beaches or Melbourne's eastern suburbs about what jobs Territorians can and can't have. But bagging out a development that supports zero and lower emissions from a place overwhelmingly powered by coal and oil, the hypocrisy is breathtaking. This is world class, best practice, certainty for investors, protecting communities and the environment, respecting the country's oldest custodians, and delivering another source of jobs as we make the energy transition. Whether it's natural gas in the near future, or critical minerals, solar, hydrogen, and other industries in the longer term. For us, it's not just about growth for the sake of it. It's about what we can do with it and what it can mean for our people. It's about making the territory more self-reliant with more of our own source revenue. It's about spreading opportunities across the territory to our regions, to our remote areas, so that our young people in the city, in the towns, and in the bush have a future in the territory, a future they can believe in. It's about the territory being able to stand on its own two feet so that we can use our growing economy to build a stronger, safer territory. Because trust me, we're tired of always looking to Canberra for help, but the reality is the Northern Territory has to confront the country's biggest social challenges with the country's smallest revenue base. And we do it across a jurisdiction that's bigger than New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania combined. And with my greatest respect to my friends in the National Cabinet, it's a lot harder to deliver housing in Peppermanati than it is in Paddington. It's a lot harder to deliver essential health care in Kalkaringi than Kew. It's harder to deliver quality schooling in Hearts Bluff than Hobart. It's harder. It's costlier to deliver roads, power, policing in the Territory. But that's what we do, because it's the right thing to do. Under our Territory Government, there are more teachers and more schools than ever before. There are more doctors, nurses and more health clinics delivered by Aboriginal community controlled health organisations than ever before. There is more essential infrastructure being built than ever before. We've built more remote houses than ever before. More than 2,700 new builds or upgrades delivered with hundreds more to come. We've done a lot, but there's a lot more to do. And we are grateful for the support we do receive from Canberra. But this idea that gets around that we get more than we're entitled to from the federal coffers is completely wrong. Across many policy areas, the funding distribution to states and territories simply does not recognise the geographical and demographic factors that we have to deal with. We make up about 1% of the national population, but nearly 20% of the landmass. With people spread across Darwin, four urban towns, 73 remote communities, and more than 500 outstations and homelands. Nearly a third of Territorians are Aboriginal, which is nearly nine times higher than the national share of population. And three quarters live in remote areas. Nearly 60% of our Aboriginal population speak a language other than English as their first language. To give you a sense of how high that is, the second highest is Western Australia where less than 13% of Aboriginal residents speak another language. So yes, there needs to be a new conversation on what needs-based funding really means. But more than anything, I hope this shows you why we are so adamant about attracting new private investment in new industries. So we can generate our own source revenue and deal with our challenges ourselves. And that's why we get our backs up when Southerners try to stop this from happening, whilst at the same time lecturing us on our challenges. We aren't blind to our problems or naive about them. We know the issues our communities face, 
because we live in them. We deal with levels of crime and disadvantage in our communities that are unacceptable. The causes are complex, interconnected and intergenerational. They are frustrating. They are heartbreaking. We will keep ensuring that there are tough consequences for crime. There has to be. That's why we've recruited more police than ever before and passed stronger laws. But if we could arrest or imprison our way out of these problems, we would have solved them a long time ago. The Northern Territory has the highest imprisonment rate in Australia. It's even higher than the United States, which has the highest of any country in the world. We need to prevent crime from occurring in the first place so that the cycle can finally be broken. And that's what we've been working so hard on. As a part of the Aboriginal Justice Agreement, we are supporting new programs to reduce offending and imprisonment rates for Aboriginal Territorians. These include new law and justice groups that will sit alongside judges in community and guide them on appropriate sentencing, providing communities with the chance to demonstrate responsibility and cultural authority in the sentencing process without removing any sentencing options. Groot Island is a beautiful part of the Territory in the Arafura Sea. I was last there just a couple of weeks ago. In the three years since new community-led justice programs were introduced on Groot, youth crime has fallen by 95%. In fact, there is currently not one young person from Groot Island in youth detention. That's an incredible result. And it only happened because of the community's deep investment in itself. As a part of the Aboriginal Justice Agreement, we're also investing in alternatives to custody centres. The first 24-7 residential facility in Alice Springs and the second is nearing completion on Grid Island. Since the Alice Springs facility started its work, more than 400 programs have been delivered. They include psychological support, anger management, parenting, home skills, as well as managing alcohol and other drugs. It's working with big reductions in reoffending. Of the 28 women who have completed the six month residential program, so far of them, 22 have not gone on to reoffend. One of the policies I'm most proud of is local decision making. It gives the communities the ability to decide what services they need and puts them in control of their priorities and aspirations. Local decision making agreements between government and community can cover issues like housing, health, education, economic development, jobs and training, law and justice, environmental sustainability and local service delivery. Groot signed the first agreement in 2018, 11 more have been signed since and there are a further 24 under development. We know that communities in control of themselves and their future with jobs for adults and opportunities for kids are communities which are safer, which are stronger. And we know that because we see these good stories in the Territory too. I'm willing to bet most people in this room spend a lot of time on planes. I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with the Qantas booking website that invites you to purchase a carbon offset for your flight. What you might not know is where these offsets are created. One of the places is an outstation community Kabawanamu in West Arnhem Land. There, traditional owners use an ancient technique called cool burning to manage both carbon and weeds in their incredible environment. They are now recognised as world class in land management and they are investing those gains back into their community out of the vision of their elders who spent years battling bureaucracy. They have created their own community school to give their kids an on-country education in combination with a Western education. There is a community with a sustainable economy, with jobs on country, with kids learning on country. It's what we want to see more of. Because by and large, kids who are in school are far more likely to stay on the right path. Kids who finish school are far more likely to go to uni, get a traineeship or get a job. And adults with jobs who have the autonomy and the dignity that employment brings are far less likely 
to turn to alcohol or violence and are far more likely to set the right example for the generation that follows. And that's what it all comes back to, doing the right thing by Territory kids, building a better future for them. That's why I studied to be a teacher like my parents. It's why I first put my hand up to represent my local area in Parliament, even though I was 38 weeks pregnant at the time. And it's why I'm serving as the Territory's Chief Minister. Because as a born and bred Territorian, I know how special our part of the world is. I know how incredible our people are. I know that our potential is just about limitless. And I'm determined to make sure we realise it. Because Territory kids deserve it. The same life chances as any other child in our great country. So today I've tried to tell the full ter Territory story. All of it. All that we are and all that we know we can be. We are much more than what you might read in the headlines. We are much more than what some people in this town like to think we are. A photo op when it's convenient, a political point when it can be scored, but otherwise a place easy enough to be ignored. But it can't be ignored any longer, and it won't be. Because as I've explained, we are the answer to some of the biggest questions confronting our country in the 21st century. Defence and strategic positioning, the Territory is the answer. Renewable energy, the Territory is the answer. The transition to net zero, the Territory is the answer. Critical minerals and rare earths, the Territory is the answer. New value adding industries, the Territory is the answer. The future that we're building for this generation and the ones that follow. A future that every Territorian can be a part of in a Territory that we can all be proud of. And we want you to be a part of that future too. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks so much, Chief Minister. Um, You've talked today about you know, nonsense being sprouted, particularly by teals and trolls, um, which brings us to Middle Arm, um, the big uh, project which both you and the federal government are saying are a sustainable uh, energy um, uh, project. Um, and the federal government has, as you said, put one and a half billion dollars into it. But it is also true that um, it's very contentious in the territory with environmental groups. Um, that um, Tambourin, um, the fracking company, um, has, is an anchor um, tenant of it uh, and um, it's seen as, um, sorry, let me just get the wording here, um, it's seen as an enabler of um, you know, exports from the Beetaloo Basin. So can you tell us how much of the project will be involved in renewable energy and how much of it is actually about fossil fuels, whether it's exportable gas or other sorts of uh, petrochemical based industries? I think it's really important for people to understand on the East Coast. We care more about our environment than anyone. It's where we go fishing. It's where my kids were swimming just a couple of weeks ago. And it has been and will continue to go through rigorous assessments. It has circular economy principles. And so it is around transitioning our territory, our country and the world to those critical minerals that we need to make that transition. And so it's had a lot of research, a lot of assessments, and that will continue. But it has absolutely been through rigorous environmental processes and will continue to do so. And it's about the opportunities from those critical minerals. So what will be processed there is what goes into our iPhones, it's what goes into our solar panels, it's what goes into our electric cars. So there is so much more to it than those simplistic headlines that keep being pushed around. If I could just ask you uh, a separate question, um, taking my presidential uh, rights in hand, which is, uh, which once again just goes to um, the debate in the t Territory. Um, you've basically had a ban on the NT Independent uh, website from attending your uh, government press conferences and obtaining information uh, from the government. Why is that happening and 
you know, shouldn't you be lifting it if you're interested, given it's broken a lot of important stories in the Territory, shouldn't you be lifting that in the name of press freedom and broader debate in, in the Northern Territory? I think we're going to have to disagree on this one. We feel that it's, it's a blog page and it's not a professional media outlet. It's won all sorts of awards for its coverage. I think we're, you know, we can use up valuable time here, and, but it's for us. It's not a professional media organisation. Uh, there's been a lot of um, misinformation and it's not prof a professional organisation. Ben Westcott has a question. Uh, ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Thank you very much for your speech, Chief Minister. I just want to um, go back to uh, Laura's question. Um, on Middle Arm, you've used your speech to describe it as sustainable, as... Uh, you know, a supporter of renewable energy, and no one's disputing Northern Territory's right to industrialise and to do, you know, create jobs, all that great stuff. But there is no doubt that FOIs have shown that this is a major export point for fossil fuels, for, for gas, for the Beetaloo Basin, um, which will increase, you know, emissions for Australia. So how is describing it as sustainable anything other than just greenwashing, basically? So it has circular economy principles. So we have the same net zero emissions as many other jurisdictions, the federal government and countries in the world. Net zero emissions by 2050 and 50% renewables by 2030. So that site there will allow us, there's green hydrogen, there's critical minerals, there is a number of processing plants for those critical minerals. So it's an opportunity to create jobs and to create that pathway for those industries, not only to be simply digging up and exporting them overseas, but to be processing them there so that we can gain, as I said in my speech, the most from them for our jurisdiction and for our country. And I think it's really important for the rest of the country to understand there is significant work done. We have environmental experts, you might not realise that, but we have the same professional standards as other jurisdictions and we have the same overall goals. So it has all been taken into account with that project there. Absolutely, but what's the balance between fossil fuel exports and those critical mineral, you know, manufacturing, uh, uh, processing? Like, are we talking 80% fossil fuels, 50%? Like, what's the balance there? So, as I said, it's got a circular economy principle. We've already had CSIRO talking about carbon capture and storage, carbon capture, storage and utilisation. And so there is a range of opportunities there, but it is absolutely a way for us using uh, renewable energies that we have and we've also got um, water um, with the Arrows, the Adelaide River off water storage um, precinct that is being developed to have these jobs not just simply digging up and exporting overseas, but actually seeing manufacturing here in the Territory and in Australia. Thanks. Thank you. Sarah Eisen. Sarah Eisen from The Australian, thank you for your address. Just on reconciliation and The Voice, the Northern Territory is on its own journey when it comes to treaty making, of course. Do you think a voice to parliament is necessary before such treaties can be negotiated? And do you envisage two treaties, one with, that the Northern Territory negotiates and one that the Commonwealth negotiates? I think what I would say to the rest of the nation is don't be afraid of The Voice. Don't be afraid of listening to communities around their aspirations. We have evidence of that in the Northern Territory that has shown huge success, and I've outlined some of that here today. In terms of the treaty process, we undertook an independent report into treaty, and we look forward to progressing that at a Northern Territory level. And I think this is around acknowledgement and then working with our First Nations people around what they want to see. Will the Northern Territory pursue treaty making, though, if regardless of the outcome of the voice? We've got the referendum, obviously, October to November, depending on that. Will that change what your government does regarding treaty making? So from us, our perspective, we've seen the success with local decision making, with listening, with empowering communities. And so we will continue on that path. I very much hope the rest of the nation sees that the voice is not something to be afraid of, that when we start by listening, we will see the results that we all want to see across this great country. Thank you. Anna Henderson. Thank you. Uh, just in relation to the reports about the state of Indigenous uh, ch childhood education and the uh, detention situation in Central Australia, uh, I, I'm told that there is actually at the moment a situation where children are being moved from, the, from Central Australia to Darwin to be put in the Dondale Detention Centre. Can you explain how many children this applies to what supports they're getting language and culturally while they're 1,500 kilometres away and why you didn't make the call for people who um, had children on remand that there was another option for them? So I think this highlights a failed 
policy from both previous territory and federal government. We had a royal commission into youth detention and child protection, $70 million each of us put into that, and then we haven't seen a single dollar come from the Commonwealth Government around the recommendations. So we've invested heavily. We have in Alice Springs significantly um, made infrastructure changes to the youth detention facility there. The Don Dale that was highlighted in that Royal Commission and those Four Corners investigations is no longer. That's shut down. Yes, the young people are being detained in... Um, there has been changes made to the old adult prison, but we are building a new youth detention facility. But we've also done so much work around programs and around keeping young people out of detention. And today, the Northern Territory is the first jurisdiction to raise the age to 12, which was the Royal Commission's recommendation. So we have programs right across the Northern Territory. We try and stop the behaviours. We try and divert those young people, but there is consequences if they do the wrong thing. But we certainly have a huge amount of work that has been done in our detention centres and also around programs for young people. And how many children are affected? So in terms of we've made upgrades to the Alice Springs Youth Detention Facility and, as I said, we're building that new Darwin facility and we try very hard to keep those young people out of detention through those programs, through those diversion activities, through partnering with non-government organisations. I don't have the specifics of, of how many young people are in detention in either location before me, but happy to get them. You're not sure of how many people were moved? from Alice Springs to Darwin. Yeah. Operationally, they make decisions from time to time and they try and take into account connection to family. We're trying to stop those young people from even entering that detention facility or the two detention facilities we have in the Territory. Thank you. Andrew Tillett. Uh, thanks, Laura. Thanks, Chief Minister. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review. Um, we've got the federal government doing yet another review into Darwin Port and the lease. Uh, that report is apparently finished and it's with government at the moment, so we're all waiting to see what happens with that. Um, but we understand that the Chinese government are concerned about the, the length of time it's taken for that review to happen. I remember it was announced about 12 months ago when we stopped into Darwin on the way back from Jakarta. Um, it's taken a long time for that review to be finalised. Um, and they're saying that this is impeding um, the development of the port that Landbridge would like to um, further expand their, their operations there but can't because of the uncertainty over their lease conditions. Uh, have you seen any evidence of that? Is this the uncertainty hampering the development of the port? And have you spoken to the federal government um, or, or will speak to them about um, that review? Would you like it out as well? So we wouldn't have sold the port. We were very clear about that when we were in opposition. And I think if uh, time was, was done again, it wouldn't have been sold off. But the uh, Prime Minister... Commonwealth Government have undertaken that review and I look forward to discussing what the outcomes are. I haven't had that opportunity yet uh, around the Darwin port. Are you seeing any evidence of it, sort of the development not going ahead at the port because of the uncertainty or is that a bit of a straw man argument? I haven't had any information presented to me to, to back that up. Okay, thank you. Paul Carp. Thanks very much, uh, Paul Carp from The Guardian. Uh, just following from Laura and Ben's questions about the description of Middle Arm as a sustainable development precinct, what does it say about the social licence for new fossil fuels that the climate impact of new natural gas infrastructure is obscured in that way? And secondly, um, you, you've talked about the fact that it's passed all the approval processes. Could, could I please ask your position on laws that might make those approvals less likely? things like a climate trigger in the EPBC Act or David Pocock's proposal for a duty of care in climate legis legislation? So Middle Arm is still going through those processes. There's been over 200 done to date. In terms of the natural gas industry out of the Beedaloo, we put in place a moratorium. We undertook a five-year body of work. We had the Pepper Inquiry, 135 independent recommendations put to us. We've accepted them and been putting them in place. And so scope one emissions are dealt with and there's been acknowledgement from the Commonwealth in the latest climate and energy ministers meeting in their communique around scope two and three emissions. So what we're saying is we need to have a reliable, realistic transition to renewable energy. And for me, the hypocrisy from jurisdictions that are largely powered by coal and oil, when the Northern Territory, our large majority, does come from gas and we're transitioning to renewables. We've got government-owned corporations there. We're putting in place a big battery to stabilise the Darwin-Catherine power grid. So in terms of middle arm, it comes back to that point, it does have circular economy principles. So it has the opportunity using renewables for green hydrogen, 
but at the same time, if there is emissions created, we do have those opportunities for carbon capture, storage and utilisation. And so I think it's this simplistic view. And we have done a huge amount of work in this space. And if Canberra want to waste their time and money reviewing it once again, but we have done that work and it has been done independently through the Pepper inquiry and particularly with Middle Arm, we're going through those processes as a whole of project. We're not simply allowing individual projects in our beautiful harbour that in 20 years we go, oh, they all stood up individually, but as a collective, it's maybe not we want what we wanted. We're doing that cumulative impact work as well. So we're taking it a step further. And, and views on a climate trigger or, or a duty of care uh, that would make that approval process a little, a little tougher? <laughs> well, as I've just outlined, we have goals of transitioning to renewables, net zero emissions. We're undertaking that work and we will absolutely commit to those. Nick Stewart. Thank you. You've given a detailed speech and you've burnished your environmental credentials. Uh, I noticed that you didn't actually uh, talk about fracking, so I presume that because you know that, that uh, Minister Bowen has indicated you won't be able to offset those uh, uh, any uh, emissions coming from fracking, you've recognised that you can't go ahead with fracking at the moment. Uh, the second thing is, you wouldn't be claiming... Uh, you talked about hypocrisy, you, you, and I know you're not a hypocrite, so you wouldn't be claiming any sort of uh, uh, emissions reduction from, for example, carbon capture and storage before the technology is actually there and, and can be proven to work. Is that correct? So to answer the first part of your question, we've undertaken detailed work. We have 135 recommendations, yes, in there. There is recommendation that the Commonwealth Government, we've acquitted our responsibilities, they're working on acquitting theirs, but it was acknowledged in that most recent Ministerial Council meeting for the Energy and Climate Change Ministers around that recommendation. In terms of carbon capture and storage and utilisation... So, sorry, I didn't understand. Is, is fracking off the table? So what I'm saying is, for natural gas, which is part of the story to transition Australia and the world... Fr fracking. Yep. So what I'm saying to you is in terms of natural gas and the opportunities... And, and that natural gas will be obtained by, by fracking. And we've undertaken a five-year independent over process over five years. We had a moratorium when we came to government in 2016. We undertook the Pepper Inquiry. Have you read the Pepper Inquiry? No, I haven't. Have you read I the haven't. Shariba? Uh, have you noticed the difference in temperature between Canberra now and when you were here as a student? And so I would encourage people that have this strong view to go away and read the Pepper Inquiry, read the Shariba, the baseline assessments. We've gone beyond any other project that I believe in terms of making sure we understand the baseline assessments and the impact. We've put that in place and everything is captured within that report. So until you've read that report, don't try and stand here and pretend that you know more about what's going on with that industry because the no, most no, basic... I'm not talking about the industry, I'm talking about the world, the environment, the And what the I'm heat. telling you is the opportunity to read the Pepper Inquiry and the Shariba uh, process will enlighten you to inform you before you ask questions. Could I... Could... And the, other point, the other point about carbon capture and storage... So I don't think you're going to believe what I say, but CSIRO have been doing an enormous amount of work in this space. Absolutely, and they haven't... I've, I have read the CSIRO's work and they haven't found a method of actually making it uh, effective, uh, cost-effective. You just were careful with your words there, cost-effective. CSIRO are absolutely advancing the opportunities around carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and utilisation. We cannot decarbonise our world by simply flicking the switch off and going to renewables. That is not reliable, that is not realistic. There is a pathway, it is going to take everything. Carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and utilisation, transitioning to renewables, and not just solar, but including wind in that, including green hydrogen. So there is... For us to decarbonise as a nation and the world, there is multiple measures that need to be undertaken and all of that is taken into consideration. Just back on the Pepper inquiry, um, you, you made it a, a commitment that you'd implement all 135 of the recommendations and you just uh, you know, made the point that there are things that the 
Territory Government has to do and also that the Federal Government has to do, and I think this goes to possibly Paul's question about uh, in the recommendation about the Federal Water Trigger um, and also life cycle greenhouse gas emissions are being offset. Now, they haven't actually been met yet. Um, they're not completely in your control, but you have committed to fracking. So d does that mean you've broken the promise to um, deliver on uh, all of those pepper inquiries? Pepper inquiry recommendations? No. So there's 135 recommendations. We've acquitted the responsibilities we have and we've worked in with the Commonwealth around those three remaining responsibilities. So there is um, 9.8, which is the admissions, and that was um, dealt with, um, has been dealt with over some time, and I think the most recent acknowledgement was through that ministerial communique. In terms of 11.3, which is the water, I know that um, we've done a significant amount of work with the Northern Territory Water Plan, and also the Commonwealth are looking at legislation later this year or early next year. And then there's um, some recommendations around native title. Ben Westcott has another question. Thank you so much for taking our questions, Chief Minister. Um, you've mentioned critical minerals. Now, uh, Australia's obviously got a great opportunity for critical minerals, um, but other jurisdictions that are trying to ramp up their production and their refining of these minerals have done direct government investment, particularly, obviously, the US with its uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Australia's been reluctant to go down that path so far. Would you like to see, to support the Northern Territory economy, more direct investment from Canberra in uh, mining and processing critical minerals? Well, I think it comes to that perception that all mining is bad. We know that critical minerals are vital. We need them as we transition across to renewables, and that is mining. And so this is the work that's being undertaken, not only to make sure that we dig them up um, and we get that revenue from potential from export, but that we can have right through um, the chain that we can manufacture here. And so that is what we've art articulated with the Middle Arm Project. It's around allowing for that other jobs to come into the process. And in terms of direct investment from Canberra, have you asked for sort of more investment in refining in the Northern Territory and um, mining in the Northern Territory from the federal government? So the middle arm precinct around those critical minerals is a, a key part of that. And so, yes, the Commonwealth are well aware of, of the ambitions that we have, the opportunities we have there. And as I was articulating in my speech, not just to, to, to dig up and export, but to, to process right the way through and that range of critical minerals that we need. So given the, um, you know, we've got the Facing North uh, uh, panel uh, conference presentation um, in uh, Parliament House tomorrow, what are the most important things that you need federal MPs to, to know about the Northern Territory and its needs in a regulatory and legislative sense? That they can be assured that there has been around natural gas a huge a moratorium. We took time. We had an independent inquiry that there's been a huge body of work presented, not only in responding to that inquiry, but around the Shariba and the baseline community and cultural assessments, and that we don't just do things on the back of an envelope, that there is strict rigour and process, that we have scientists there, we have environmental consultants, we've done all of that work, but at the same time understand why it's so important to us to develop that own source revenue so that we can tackle the challenges rather than waiting year by year in some cases for um, resources from the Commonwealth Government. Sarah Eisen. Thank you again. Um, if I might ask on a couple of issues, uh, one of them being um, the liquor restrictions in the Northern Territory. Um, just for those who haven't been following everything, obviously there were liquor restrictions in the past. Um, you in sort of January, February said they had been ineffective. And last week or last month, you said that the current liquor restrictions are working and they are effective. So can I ask what makes this blanket ban at the moment effective? that made what ha happened before and what was in, case b in place before ineffective? So I think that it's important to acknowledge the alcohol-related harm, not only in the Northern Territory, but right across the nation. If it was easily fixed, it would have been fixed. We're talking about a legal product. There's bottles of wine on this table. People are enjoying a, a drink, but we know the harm that it causes. So in the Northern Territory, we've put in place a range of measures that are territory-wide, but we've also got individualised responses and we listen to those on the front line, police, health, that deal with the harm each day around those responsing and, and tailoring them for individual communities. And so, but therefore, Alice Springs, they are, there's a blanket ban, particularly in communities and so on. That is an effective measure in your view, is, is that correct? So there's not a blanket ban in Alice Springs. What there is, is restrictions around the trading hours, 
um, the amount of product that can be purchased and there's alcohol-free days for takeaway alcohol. In terms of people that live in the town camps and nearby communities, there is a pathway for them through a community alcohol plan that they can decide as a community if they would like to have takeaway alcohol consumed in those areas and there has to be agreement within that community and then pathways if they start to see that harm within the community in which it will be dealt with. So it's not something that is blanket across the Northern Territory. We have some communities that allow takeaway by permit, some communities that have a club where people can go to drink and they're restricted in the amount of drinks they can have. There's a range of measures in different communities. Absolutely. Just on that second topic, I wanted to ask you about the Aboriginal art industry in the NTNSA. A lot has been happening in this space. Regarding the APY Lands Arts Centre, do you have faith or what's your view about the investigation that's being led by the South Australian Government? I understand the NT is involved, but it's led by them. And do you think the APY Lands Arts Centre CEO should stand down while this investigation is being undertaken? We have an enormous opportunity with our art centres in remote communities. They're a place not only that can allow economic jobs, but also are the social fabric of the community. So I think it's really important to uphold the structure around them and that people have confidence when they're purchasing that art. It's genuine without interference. So we certainly want to see this investigated. It was disappointing to, to see those images. So I think we need to fully understand the issue before we place further comment. Okay. Anna Henderson. We have seen in a couple of jurisdictions in the lead up to the voice referendum an intention to shelve some more controversial issues or try to minimise their impact so that the referendum debate can flow through. But what are the risks for that in the Northern Territory? We, if we see a successful referendum, it could still be many months before that legislation gets through Parliament, the body being set up. In the meantime, there are obviously urgent and pressing issues in the Northern Territory. Have you had to put any controversial policies on hold because of the referendum? And what is the, the risk associated with that? I don't think it's an either or. You can get on with local decision making. You can get on with developing a treaty. At the same time, I think it's really important for people to understand the voice and what it will achieve in empowering Indigenous Territorians, Indigenous Australians, to have a view on the policies and government bureaucracy that impacts so heavily on their lives. And do you understand the argument that's being made by the No campaign around why not just put the voice in legislation rather than constitutional change? Do you think that that is resonating in the NT? I think that the No campaign are playing politics. If they looked at the evidence, particularly with local decision making, when you get out there on the ground and talk to Indigenous Territorians, they'll talk to you about their wish for self-determination, their wish for control, and that is what we've been trying to achieve through our LDM agreements, and that's what The Voice will achieve. Just finally, Noel Pearson recently said he feared that some remote Indigenous communities may not exist into the future without a voice in place to protect their interests. Do you share that concern? And what do you think at the moment is holding so many remote communities back? I think I gave examples where we've got some great success in the Territory, where we've listened to local communities. And I think that when you have bureaucracy that doesn't acknowledge, you know, delivering services across 500 outstations and homelands, 70 odd remote communities, that is an extra burden, but the benefit far outweighs that. And so if you don't have that voice understanding the importance of getting out into the regions and delivering those services, that's certainly something that would be concerning. Is it something that is also a failure of the Northern Territory Government to deliver? In terms of the service delivery? Mm. In terms of what the voice is now uh, proposed to do, is it a failure of the Northern Territory Government on some level not to provide that? I think that the Northern Territory Government is showing the rest of the nation, don't be afraid of the voice, don't be afraid of listening to our First Nations people around the control that they want in their lives and the services that are delivered for them. And when you do that, you can see great success in different examples, whether it's running schools, running healthcare clinics, developing economic opportunities, building houses. And so that would be my key takeaways. It's not something to be afraid of. It's something that will empower our Indigenous First Nations people and it will empower us as a nation. Andrew Tillett. <clears throat> uh, thank you again. Uh, I'd like to just turn to live uh, animal exports. Uh, the federal government is attempting to, to ban, to put in process in place to ban live sheep exports. Uh, that affects Western Australia mostly. It's, um, it's something that happened in the next few years, apparently. Um, the state government over there has raised concerns. Farm groups are concerned this could be the beginning of further bans that sheep one year, 
then it moves to live cattle and X, which obviously would have a big impact on the NT. Do you support the move to, to ban live animal exports and are you concerned it would spread to, to other uh, animals beyond sheep? So I don't support moves to, to overarchingly ban. I think it's really important for people to understand the processes that have been put in place, the work that is undertaken in the case that I know best, our jurisdiction and the neighbours that we export to and how everyone through that process puts the animals first, but it provides a significant economic opportunity, but it also supplies resources into those nations. And the, the current sort of suspension we're seeing that's affecting some of the live cattle out of Northern Territory to Indonesia. What are your, your thoughts on that? Is that a concern or do you think it'll be resolved pretty quickly? So we've seen just in recent days some of those animals testing positive and I think that we um, need to, to work with the Indonesian authorities. We know that the animals are getting the vaccine and it's a live vaccine when they enter Indonesia, but I have confidence that, and we do a lot of work, this is probably something that goes under the radar in terms of biosecurity, we work with our close neighbours and because we are so close, we're an hour's flying time to, to Timor-Leste and the Indonesian islands nearby there. So we do a lot of work. Um, Indonesians will, will come over and do training with our teams in our Department of Primary Industry. So there's been a lot of collaboration and I'm confident we'll be able to work through those recent test results. Thank you. Paul Cup. Could I please ask how the scope two and three emissions from Beetaloo are going to be offset? I know you touched on this in answer to, to Nick's question, but my understanding is that there's been nothing uh, beyond uh, in the Ministerial Council beyond a resolution to talk about it. So, so what's your view about how they're going to be offset? So scope two and three emissions that Energy and Climate Ministers communique acknowledges that that is something that falls outside of the Northern Territory's jurisdictional capabilities, scope one, absolutely, and that will work with the Commonwealth Government and other jurisdictions. And this comes back to us needing a realistic, reliable pathway to transition to renewable energy. So when you've got jurisdictions that are powered by oil, by coal, how do you propose that they have an energy source as we transition? Oh, okay, sorry. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna design the policy here. I'm just I'm saying you're, you're around the table. You're saying it's not your responsibility, but do, do you have a view about how that's gonna be achieved? So what I'm saying is that you've got a jurisdiction. We have got opportunities to develop Renewable energy, we're absolutely focused on that. We acknowledge all of the impacts in terms of natural gas, but it is a reliable energy source as we transition, as we decarbonise the world. And in terms of those scope two and three emissions, it's something that does need to be managed and the Commonwealth have acknowledged that working with the other jurisdictions who want the gas for a reliable energy source as they transition off oil and coal. Yeah. Maurice Riley has a question. Thank you, Chief Minister. Um, do you wish you were a Tasmanian? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you're not the first state or territory leader to come to this forum and say Canberra's not listening or not listening closely enough. Uh, but it does tend to be that those who are, who are in the states who get 12 senators seem to get a better, a better deal in Canberra because of their representation in Canberra. So do you think in the future... Uh, that statehood for the Territory, and I'm sure Andrew Barr would agree with you, uh, if, the, if, if you say yes, that statehood somewhere should be on this country's agenda for a very significant part of uh, Australia's landmass. So I think statehood is important, and I think that it's important because right now we have the two senators and the two House of Rep seats, and so sometimes that does make us easy to ignore when it comes to, to commitments, and particularly when you see, you know, these East Coast views, which I think are largely um, not based on the evidence. People haven't gone and read the Pepper Inquiry. They haven't read the Shariba. And so from my perspective, we absolutely would love to be a state, but it's not the biggest priority for us right now in the Territory. It's not the issue that people are knocking down the, you know, on the Sunday morning markets to talk to me about. It's about jobs, about tackling our social challenges as we progress forward. And just on indulgence, uh, Madam President, uh, you didn't say much about tourism today. What's, the, you know, it's, it's what we, what you say, what we know you for tourism and those uh, iconic sites, but uh, what is the vision for tourism? 
So tourism is one of our industries, like agriculture, that we've got right now that has you know, a significant number of jobs for Territorians. We've done an enormous amount of work as a government supporting our tourism industry through COVID-19 and the challenges, um, enhancing the visitor experience, but also focusing on that um, authentic cultural experience that many, both domestic and international tourists, wish to have from the Territory. I was hoping you'd say direct flights to Canberra to Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we do I, have an aviation attraction fund. <laughs> well, I think um, we're all going home to read the Pepper Inquiry cover to cover. <laughs> um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in thanking the Chief Minister for speaking. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. And um, come back and see us a bit more regularly. Thank you. Thank you.